Good morning or good whenever. I appreciate you taking time to tune in and listen. I will encourage you to uh, follow along all the way to the end. I think God has a very powerful word in the times in which we are living. And I think you'll recognize that very quickly as we walk through the scriptures. Also, at the end, I want to lead you, uh, dad, mom, grandma, grandpa, or whoever, to lead your family in the Lord's Supper. And we'll talk more about that. You may want to pause now and go grab you a cracker or two and, and maybe some bread and break it up and just get some cups and some some juice of whatever that you have. Don't get don't get hung up on what you have or what you don't have. Uh, just get something there so that you guys can can partake of the Lord's Supper together. And again, we'll we'll talk about that more at the end. But now I want you to take your Bible and I want you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 15. And if you want to stop now as well, even at this point, and just pray and just ask God to open your heart up to his truth, to really hear, I would encourage you to get a pen, a piece of paper, uh, to take some notes and really try to capture on paper what God is speaking into your life. Uh, but nonetheless, Exodus chapter 15, uh, we'll read a few verses in just a moment. But let me say this. Let me say this just for time's sake, okay? I'm not going to go back and recap everything that's going on, but, but here's the deal. Israel, the people of God, are on the mountaintop. They have just experienced God in a mighty way as they have been brought out of Egypt by the outstretched arm of the Lord. They have just been set free from their bondage, and they have seen God do an unbelievable miracle to, to, to lead them across the Red Sea. And like I said, you can go back and read about that. But again, they're on a mountaintop because they were in a situation where they could not save themselves. They could not deliver them. Unless God intervenes and delivers them, they are going to live and die in that bondage. So let me just make this point for a moment. 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says that all things that happened to Israel are examples for us. You can go read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And so as we look back at Israel, the people of God in the Old Testament, we can learn something about our relationship with God today in the New Testament. And that's exactly what I want to do, okay? Because things that happen to them, we can see have also happened to us. Things that happen in their walk with God, we can see that happen in our walk with God. As you look at chapter 15, you'll find that the majority of it is uh, about this amazing time of worship. It actually includes a song that they sang together as they celebrated the deliverance of of the Lord. And so the majority of it, all the way through verse 21, talks about this amazing time of worship. But in verse 21, that time of worship ends and their journey with God begins. Their walk with God begins. And it is not long that they realize that their journey with God, their walk with God, is going to lead them into some difficult places. Let's read verse 22 of chapter 15. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur and they went three days in the wilderness and they found no water. Now when they came to Mar, they could not drink the waters of Mar for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. And the people complained against Moses saying, what shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree when he cast it in the waters, the waters were made sweet. And there he made a statute, an ordinance for them. And there he tested them. And he said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals and then verse 27, then they came to Elam where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. So they camped there by the waters. Thank God for the Elams. 
thank God for the Elams, uh, for those blessings. And we'll talk more about that in a moment, okay? But the worship service that took place after their deliverance is over. It's over. It, it in some ways reminds me of the excitement and the joy one feels after they get saved. And then as they begin to walk with God, they begin to experience the challenges of life, almost to the point where they're thinking, man, am I doing something wrong? But the reality is if we walk with God, we are going to end up in difficult places because that's something you need to know from the text is that they end up here at Mar because God led them there, okay? Walking with him will have its challenges, but I need to remind you that it's all for your good. It's all for your good. It's all for your growth. It's all for your maturity. It's all in the process of God making you more like Jesus making you more how he already sees you to be so that you can relate to and love the world the way that Jesus Christ did. So they've left Egypt. Egypt is no more. They're not going backwards. They are bound for Canaan land, okay? God took them out of bondage and now he's taking them to Canaan, which I believe is a picture and representative of maturity in the Christian life, a picture of the abundant life. But let me say, when it comes to God and our relationship with God, you do not go backwards. God is not about going backwards. God is about moving you forward into the fullness of the life that Jesus Christ died and has allowed you and I to enjoy. Now, when we look at the life of Israel and we look at how they walked with God. Their walking with God demonstrates a few important things, a couple important things about this walk, and that is that God is leading them. God is, is the one leading them. And in leading them, God is the one who provides for them. He led them into the wilderness. He took them out of a place where they could easily provide for themselves into a place where they had to depend on God to provide for them. It's a picture of what God wants us to enjoy, the life of faith, learning how to depend on him and seek him for everything in our lives. We also learn that in this walk, there are times that God will take you to the limit. The Bible says they went three days with no water. The body, they tell us, can go three days without water, but after three days, the body will begin to break down. Sometimes God will take you to the limit when you feel like you're not going to make it. But then you make it. Let me just say this. The Bible says in the text that they got thirsty and they wanted to know what they were going to drink. Let me just say this, that in this journey with God, the thirst is absolutely necessary. The thirst is absolutely necessary. We cannot, we must not waste this time that you and I are experiencing of difficulty through this virus and all the different ways that it is affecting us, that it is making life uncomfortable for us, that it is taking away the normal for us. We cannot waste this because many of the children of Israel, they wasted it. They wasted it. They did not learn from it. So we cannot waste this virus. We cannot waste how it's impacting our lives because it's absolutely necessary in order for us to know God and to grow as children of God. God is faithful. He is will provide. The Elam is coming. The Elam is coming. Remember that. Now, how did the children of Israel respond? Let's look at that for a moment. Now, I want to connect with them because there's no doubt this was a tough situation. I mean, they've been three days walking. They don't have water. And then when they do see water, they realize that they cannot drink the water. How frustrating this must be for them. It's difficult. And I know for many of you right now, you are facing great difficulty. You are in a situation that you do not want to be in. But let me just say 
that when you truly walk with God, when you make that decision of faith to receive Christ and enter the family of God and walk with him, you are going to go through difficult situations. Situations that you will not like. Situations that you will not want to be there. You will think that something is wrong. You will think that you need to be somewhere else. You will think that it's not fair. You will want it to stop immediately. But now more than ever before, we've got to recognize that God is sovereign, that he brought us out of death to life. He brought us out of darkness into life. He brought us into his family. He brought us into this relationship that we might walk with him. And in this walk, we are going to go through difficulty. And in the midst of that, we have got to recognize his sovereignty in this relationship. Okay? But they didn't recognize his sovereignty. What did they do? They complained. So my question is, where's the song now? Where is the dancing? Where is the celebration? I mean, it's one thing for us to go into the church building and have a great time. And there's a lot of people, they choose a particular church because of the great speaker, because of the great worship, because their kids want to go there, because they have this program or that. People choose churches for a lot of different reasons. But here's the thing. We can go to a building and we can have the greatest time possible. But here's what I want to know. What are you like when it gets tough? What are you like when the music fades and all is stripped away? I think it's interesting that some years ago, a man by the name of Matt Redman wrote a song, The Heart of Worship. The first verse says, when the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the ways things appear. You're looking into my heart. And then he says in the chorus, I'm coming back. God, help us come back to the heart of worship. God, help us not come out on the other side of this virus the same way we were at the beginning. God, help us come back through all of this to the heart of worship. As it says in the chorus where it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus May this lead us to say, I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing that I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. It's what it's all about. It's about him. So for the people of Israel, it's almost like, hey, guys, where's the song now? What happened? Where's, where's that celebration and that song that you were singing before when you were celebrating God before what's happened. I mean, even later, sadly, as you read more about the life of Israel, they would have difficult times like this and they wouldn't want to go back to Egypt. They would want to go back to the, to the place where they found it to be the easiest. And I admit, for me, it is easier when I'm in control. It is easier determining where I go and what I do on my own time and when it's convenient for me. I get that. It is much more challenging to just totally let go, give up the reins, let God lead and move in his ways on his times. It's, it's more challenging, but I'm telling you, it's what he's calling us into. They complained. This happens to all of us. But then there is a tree that is revealed in verse number 25. And here's, here's what I really want you to see. Because we're in a bitter place right now. I haven't talked to anybody. I haven't talked to anybody who's not said, hey, can't wait until this is over. We're in a bitter place. It's affecting all differently. There's a lot of people, even myself at times, we want it to stop. But just let me remind you that pruning, discipline, coaching, training, all this stuff that God, who loves us more than we could ever imagine, allows us to experience for, for purposes 
uh, so much greater. Let me just remind you that when the Father is pruning, when the Father is disciplining, when the Father is training, we must allow him to finish the process. Let patience have its perfect work. Let the trial, let the bitter moment, let the difficulty accomplish its purpose in our life. So here's a question. How can we turn this bitter situation into something that's sweet? Look at verse 25. Moses cries out to the Lord. The Lord showed him a tree, and when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. And there God made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. you got to see this. Moses prays, and God shows him a tree. That word showed in the Hebrew actually means to instruct or to teach. And so God taught Moses. He instructed Moses something about a tree. And whatever God told him about this tree, it led Moses to cast it into those bitter water. So what about this tree? What is so significant and unique about this tree? Well, you do the study. You follow the trail throughout the Bible as it talks about a tree, and you will find that your study of the tree will lead you to the ultimate tree, which is the cross, the cross on which Jesus, the tree on which he hung when he became your curse, when he became my curse. As Paul said in Galatians 3, cursed is the man who hangs on a tree. The Bible says he became the curse for us that he might set us free from the law. So the tree too, according to the book of Revelation, from this tree would come healing for the nations. So I feel like that this is kind of like the main point of what God showed me through all of this. The tree, which in this situation represents in a symbolic way the cross. When this tree is applied to the bitter, guess what? A miracle happens. Now what was bitter is made sweet. What was undrinkable is now drinkable. What was unusable is is now usable. It changed the situation, right? It changed the situation. So, so how do I get through this, Pastor? How do I get through this difficult time and all of the, the challenges that I'm facing because of this? I mean, when you got parents that are now at home a lot more with their kids and everybody's about to, to pull their hair out and everything's chaotic right now. There are so many of us that are complaining and we just wish that it was over, that we could get back to normal. But please, for a moment, listen to this preacher who is telling you that God does not want us to go back to the normal. That's the point. God does not want us going back to the normal because he's leading us forward. He's taking us to Canaan. He's wanting to use this to grow us and mature us and make us more in, in practicality who he already sees us to be. So instead of complaining, church, we have got to learn to find refuge in the truth of Jesus and his finished work on the cross. The cross matters right now. The cross must be applied to this difficult, bitter situation in our lives because here's the point the cross reminds us of how god is so wonderful in taking things that look bad in the natural and making something beautiful out of it in the spiritual realm i mean from the world's perspective the cross was terrible i mean how in the world could this innocent man could this man who had done so much good for people, how in the world could he have died this way? And that's what it looked like in the natural. And yes, in this life, we look around and we don't see anything good maybe coming out of this difficult situation, but we must remember that the shepherd, the good one, the beautiful one has an amazing way of taking what looks bad from our perspective and making something 
beautiful out of it. It's making something productive, making something usable in our lives, church. To the world, the cross may look horrible, but to God, the cross was him taking away the sins of the world. The cross was him reconciling the world to himself. The cross was his way of providing an open door, providing salvation, an opportunity for salvation for everyone. So in those bitter moments of our lives, like the one we're in now, we need to partake of communion more than ever because we need to remember the cross. We need to remember that God in his goodness and his power can make all things beautiful and he is using this, yes, this for good in our lives and for his glory. We must remember and celebrate what Christ has done for us. We must remember and celebrate that body that was broken, that blood that was shed in order to take away the sin of the world and reconcile us to the Father. So church, allow the cross to change your perspective in life right now and realize that he's shaping you, he's molding you, He's preparing you to love the world like he did. And yes, it may seem bitter, but guess what? Elam was right around the corner. If I were to have to entitle this message, I would entitle it, It's Mara Today, But Elam Is Coming. It's Mara Today, But Elam Is Coming. Mara, the actual word means bitter. It's bitter today, but I'm telling you, Elam, the place of blessing, the place of rest, the place of, of growth, the place of learning to trust and abide in Christ more, it is coming. And it's always the result of the times of difficulty in our lives. I don't know if you've ever went back to the map in your Bible to just actually see how far Elam was away from Mar, but Elam was just south of Mar, and guess what? It was only about five miles. It was only about five miles down the road. And it's crazy to me because the people were complaining and they were fussing. Because from their perspective, they could not see that Elam was right around the corner. And so I can only imagine that for a lot of them, they weren't able to enjoy Elam because they didn't act right when they were in Mara. You see, the Elams are the blessings that flow from every tribe. It's the blessings where we learn that God is faithful, that God has got this thing. The Elams represents the rest in our hearts that result as we experience God's goodness and God's faithfulness. And as you study the text, you, you, you find, you see, when the Bible said at the end of 25 that he tested them, it, it literally meant to, to test them meant to allow difficulty, allow difficulty to enter in to reveal the quality of something or someone. He, he wanted them to see these flaws. He wanted them to see their weakness so that they could understand what he really wanted for them. He knows that the reason, God knows that the reason for the wilderness time in their lives is to work out all of the, the Egypt stuff that's in them where they're going to take care of themselves and provide for themselves and do everything and fix everything. And that's what that life was, but that's not the life that God is calling us into because verse 26 reveals what he really wants. He just wants us to, to heed his voice to listen and obey his voice, to take seriously what he commands and to do what he's asking us to do. And I'm grateful that in verse 26, it was kind of a conditional thing. If you do this, then I will do this. But I'm grateful 
that Jesus Christ is my representative, that the promise here of his healing is not contingent on whether I'm going to do it right or whether I'm going to do it perfect, but the promise is contingent on the perfection and the life of Jesus Christ. So I get the promise. I get the healing. Heal, the healing. I get to enjoy the Elams because Jesus Christ is my representative. God is not looking at my obedience. He's looking at the perfect obedience of Jesus. And he's saying, he was perfect. Therefore, I'm going to bless you with the Elams in your life. See, the world needs to know this wonderful truth about Jesus. Paul said, I'm obligated to the Jew and the Gentile. We owe the world. We owe the world. We need to let God have his way so that we can serve and love the world the way God wants us to. Father, thank you for Jesus. And I pray that this time as we partake of the Lord's Supper and we remember what he did for us, that we remember that through his suffering came the blessing of salvation, that we remember as we apply the cross to this bitter time in our lives, that we remember, that we remember that God, that you're going to take this Mara and turn it into an Elam in our lives. Amen, amen. Well, at this time, all I'll say is this, just to kind of provide you with a little guidance. If you want to, take your Bible and turn to Matthew 26. Moms, dads, whoever's going to lead this, take some time to just read Matthew 26, verse 26 through 30. And then I would encourage you to pass out your little cups of juice and your, your, your bread, however, whatever you've got. And then I'll tell you to just take a little time and, and, and spend in, in worship just remembering, just thanking God for what he has done for you that you might enjoy a relationship with him and, and partake of that. Actually, we've got a song recorded or you can use your own songs, but uh, April is, is gonna sing a song, How Deep the Father's Love, which is absolutely one of my favorites. Um, but then I'll just encourage you, uh, you know, after you sing that song and Maybe you want to just spend some time in worship. Maybe you just want to get some other music and just worship with your family. And then I would encourage you to close uh, in prayer and maybe just have everybody pray in their own way. Wow, uh, I wish I could be there uh, or be a fly on the wall and just enjoy this time with you. But I just pray that you'll let the Spirit of God move in and just enjoy a wonderful time uh, remembering and celebrating uh, our wonderful Savior and what he's done for us. And in so doing, remember, Jesus is coming. So may we be found faithful, walking with him and busy about what he's called us to do. Thank you for tuning in. Have a great rest of the day.